Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Michelle Wong, and I'm a researcher at Asia Art Archive. Uh, for those of you who's here for the first time, welcome. And for those of you who've been, I see many familiar faces, welcome back. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure um, to have everyone here. Um, I just wanted to flag a couple of things before we start, is that um, because of the event tonight, uh, our library upstairs is actually staying open until 8.30. And so all of you are welcome to um, go up there to browse as well as to see our latest um, 15 invitations um, exhibition by Wang Wai Yin called Talking Archive, where uh, we've actually invited through um, Wang Wai Yin, a medium to actually speak to some of our archival materials and uh, some of the results are displayed upstairs. Um, and tonight we are very, very pleased to have Christine Curry with us um, for the talk, as you can see from the slide, Past is Quiet, from Archive to Speculative Exhibition Histories. Um, Rasha Salty, unfortunately, hasn't, um, is not able to join us due to um, family uh, personal reasons, um, but we miss her, but we are very, very um, glad to have Christine with us. Uh, I'll just do a short introduction of um, Christine Curry. Christine Curry is a Beirut-based independent writer and researcher. Uh, she and Rasa Salti are the co-founders of History of Arab Modernities on the Visual Arts Study Group, uh, <laughs> where their current research um, focuses on um, kind of the topic of tonight, uh, the history of the 1978 exhibition called the International Art Exhibition for Palestine. Uh, which transformed into, their research transformed into another exhibition uh, called Past is Quiet, Narratives and Ghosts of the International Art Exhibition of Palestine 1978, uh, and for which uh, we'll hear about much more tonight. This exhibition, the first iteration was showed in Makba in Barcelona in 2015, and most recently from March to May 2016 was in Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin. And apart from her research on this 1978 exhibition, Christine has also um, curated exhibitions um, such as The Founding Years, 1969 to 1973, The Sultan Gallery, uh, selected works from the Sultan Art Gallery collection. And the Sultan Gallery is one of the most long-standing um, galleries in the Arab world uh, and uh, seminal art history over there. Uh, Christine has also contributed to various publications and is the section editor of the publication accompanying the exhibition Time Piss Out of Joint, uh, recently shown in Sharjah Al Foundation earlier this year. And um, Christine is no stranger to Asia Art Archive here. She was first here in 2013 um, for Sites of Construction, which is a conference that AA held um, considering exhibitions as a site of art historical construction. and. Uh, an area of interest that we continuously explore and deepen. Um, Christine has also co-organized a digitization workshop uh, with our colleague Sabi Ahmed in uh, the Global Art Forum in Kuwait 2015 um, under the name, very catchy, Dis Digitize or Disappear. And um, so it's with, uh <laughs> it I'm very, very happy that uh, Christine is back here. And um, tonight, Christine will focus her talk on her methods of research, uh, which is more like detective work and how that transforms into exhibition. And the format of tonight, uh, of perhaps an hour or an hour or 15 minutes, is we'll have Christine speak first for 40 to 45 minutes. Um, I myself will then have a short conversation with her and we'll quickly open up um, for a Q&A. And um, both Christine and Rasha are excellent storytellers, and I'm personally really thrilled um, about tonight. So without um, further ado, over to you, Christine, and take us through the rabbit hole. Oh, it's deep. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Michelle. Um, first, I want to thank everyone at the Asia Art Archive, in particular Michelle, Hamad, um, Joey, and Claire for hosting uh, me tonight to speak about a project that has been my life for many years now and continues to kind of take over my life. So it's a really a pleasure to share it, uh, to share it with you um, and this far east, which is the first time, kind of the furthest we've taken it. Um, unfortunately today, as I, okay, as Michelle mentioned, uh, just one of two of us are here. So my colleague Rasha Salti is a uh, my co-conspirator on this project, and we work hand in hand on this research and on the exhibition Past is Quiet. So it's usually a dog and pony show, so maybe it's just a pony show today. Um, so the project which I'll speak about today um, began with a catalog um, and proceeded much like a detective story, um, but instead of s hunting for artworks, uh, we were hunting for a history of an exhibition which we knew very little of to start. Um, 
this exhibition's archival and documentary traces had almost been entirely lost. Um, and over seven years of research, we transformed, after seven years of research, or as it continues, we transformed the research into a documentary and archival exhibition uh, called Past is Quiet, uh, narratives and ghosts from the International Art Exhibition for Palestine, which Michelle mentioned. Um, so I'll be sort of telling the story of the research through the exhibition, so I'll sort of be going in and out, and using the first iteration of our exhibition in Barcelona from 2015 as that example, and we'll end with sort of the differences as the exhibition tours and the additional research that we're sort of adding into to the project. Sorry, I'm like double computering it, but it's gonna be worth it. <laughs> the catalog for the International Art Exhibition for Palestine was found uh, by us in a, in a gallery, in an, um, the library of an art gallery in Beirut. Upon further reading of the catalog, it was an exhibition of exceptional scale and scope that took place in Beirut in the middle of the Civil War. And until today, the exhibition remains one of the most ambitious in scale and scope to have ever been showcased in the Arab world. Opening in March 1978 in Beirut, Lebanon, and only two weeks after the Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon, we wondered how an exhibition of this scale could have happened at such a moment. The exhibition was comprised of some 200 artworks donated by artists hailing from nearly 30 countries. Some are well known, uh, some are lesser known. Miro, Tapias, for example, and other sort of obscure artists from Italy are sort of the, the other end of the spectrum. The works in this exhibition were intended as a seed collection for a museum in exile, uh, in, in support or in solidarity with the Palestinian cause, which would take the form of an itinerant exhibition meant to tour the world until it could be repatriated uh, to a free and democratic Palestine. <coughs> the International Art Exhibition for Palestine was organized by the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, and within the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was essentially what functioned as the government and was this, you know, in 1974 recognized as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. The PLO, which I'll refer to, was based in Beirut. Their office was in Beirut at the time, um, or kind of out of where they operated until 1982. So the PLO had different art sections. One of those sections was um, called the Office of Unified Information. Under that section, there was the plastic art section, and they were the ones who were responsible for this exhibition that took place. So the exhibition was inaugurated in Beirut, um, and, uh, and I will show you, so this, show you some images of it. Uh, these, this is a photo of two artists, uh, both Palestinian artists making the banner for the show some images, photos of installation, touring the exhibition. This is another exhibition I'll speak about later. So this is the front, so they, the catalog is a bilingual Arabic English catalog. Um, and uh, so the exhibition was inaugurated in Beirut uh, and held, it was a collection, so it was held in an office. Um, and in June of the same year, actually probably in May or so, the works traveled uh, to Tokyo. A hundred works of this collection traveled to Tokyo um, and as part of an exhibition which I'll speak about. And then later some of the, part of the collection traveled to Tehran in 1980, part of the collection then traveled to Oslo. So the idea to do this exhibition in Beirut, have this collection that lived there and tour it, did in fact happen. It traveled to a few places. Maybe we'll find out that it, part of this collection traveled elsewhere. Um, but we'll fast forward to 1982, when the Israeli army advanced onto Beirut and held the city under siege, with the objective of forcing the PLO out of Beirut uh, and forcing them to leave, which they succeeded. And the building where the collection was stored was shelled, along with the offices of the Unified Information Front, or Unified Information Office, where most of the exhibition's paper trail would have been. Some of the works uh, from the collection were moved out and saved. This is a much longer story, but it's not the focus of our project, but I'm happy to speak about it later. And for us, really, all that seemed to remain was uh, were the memories of some of the people who made this happen and those who had visited it. I'm just gonna take you through some pages of the exhibition catalog. So you have a sense of uh, some artists' names may seem familiar, some artists' names are misspelled. We will 
And when you see the, the list of artists, the highest number of participating artists uh, were from Poland, Italy, France, and Japan. So we asked ourselves, this is sort of one of the questions, and I'll talk about what our process was, but we asked why were there so many from certain countries and why there, were there so few from other countries. Um, and really, you know, as I'll, I'll speak about it, trying to understand why, why certain artists were in and why certain artists were not a part of it, it was very important for sort of our process. And this, um, these names, the names of the artists, the names of the, from the acknowledgements page, this was sort of our, um, our evidence that we used and really went name by name to figure out who was around, who we could speak to, um, and who these people were. Many of these names uh, are, were very unfamiliar to us, um, and still we have very little material about them, but we know a little bit more. Others we've been able to meet, and they've shared hours and hours of their time with us sharing stories and documents. This here is um, just the, the outside of the catalog from the exhibition in Japan, which I'll speak a little bit about later. One of the pages from the catalog. So what we actually notice, starting with this catalog from Beirut in 78, is um, documentation of what we imagine is most of the exhibition, but of course not all of the works. You don't necessarily put all of the artworks in an exhibition catalog. And a few months later, we actually see new artwork, which we didn't see in the previous catalog. So we know the exhibition grew, perhaps, um, Perhaps some works uh, didn't make it in time to be part of the first catalog. This is, uh, I'm just showing you a few images from the opening ribbon cutting of the exhibition in Tokyo in 78. And it was quite substantial. It was probably the largest selection of the works that traveled outside of Beirut of 100, pe 100 pieces. So really, we were, we were starting with a catalog. Um, and this, so this is the front and back. The artwork that's very colorful is by Argentinian artist Julio Le Parc. Uh, we actually, d we, he didn't actually, from what we can tell, donate this work uh, that was used for the catalog. He gave another work. Um, and the exhibition was supposed to be up just for a few weeks' time, but we know it was extended for, and it was open for over a month and a half because they could keep it open and people were interested in it. These are, again, some pages from the from the catalog, the acknowledgements page. And here, this is sort of the core of, of what this exhibition is and sort of what our questions have been. Art for the solidarity, art, art in solidarity with Palestine. Again, a very bad translation from Arabic. Um, this is a text written by the sort of custodian of the exhibition, the main organizer from the plastic art section. Um, her name is Mona Sodi, and she's a, she's a Jordanian artist who's, who still lives in Beirut. Um, and there was a text uh, translated by, a text by Roberto Mata about his support sort of for the Palestinian cause. And there were different texts, letters from arts organizations, uh, the message from the Japanese artist, which I'll tell you about more, written by Ichiro Haryu, uh, who is the president of the Japan Afro-Asian Latin American <laughs> Artists Association. <laughs> If only we came up with these <laughs> names today. It still exists, actually. The organization still exists. So we see, you know, just by using the catalog to try to understand who participated, who um, sent their support through a letter, through an, an, an actual artwork, we see the Danish Communist Party's Middle East Group, um, Romanian Committee for Fine Arts, um, you know, this arts association. So. Sorry, repeating them again. So kind of in trying to understand um, why we did this project, we found a catalog. M many people find exhibition catalogs. Some of them are some seemingly interesting. Um, but we were really fascinated by, as I said, the scale and scope of an exhibition. To this day, we don't think an exhibition of this scale and of this breadth of internationalism has happened in Lebanon. And there are a lot of really great exhibitions that happen in Beirut. And not to say that this is the best show that happened, but it's a, it's a very important um, moment for us to ask why, um, what kinds of exhibitions were happening during the 70s, during the 60s versus today. Today is a very different landscape in the, in the world. Um, internationalism or solidarity is very different today than it was in the 1970s. And both Russia and I, um, we, uh, we're, we're sort of intrinsically interested in 
exhibition history. Um, and there has been more recently, and as we've been working, a renewal and interest in looking at the modern period in the Arab world and looking at the 60s and 70s and trying to understand who was exhibiting what sort of production was being made. Um, Today, unfortunately, many auction houses sort of write that history. Uh, while there is scholarship around modern art from the Arab world, uh, which is probably strongest in Europe and in particular in the US, uh, these sort of stories don't translate back to the region uh, the way they should. Of course, there are artists also who engage with sort of questions of art history as well, but um, those tell different stories, perhaps. So both Russia and I were, were kind of asking questions around the social history of art in the Arab world, doing interviews with people like gallerists, collectors, um, and art critics. And, and after having found this catalog, we decided that we want to sort of dedicate our time to trying to understand how an exhibition like this happened. So we really went, we used the pages um, and worked like detectives. We really went page by page, focusing on this page of acknowledgments and these two pages of artist names. Um, to try to figure out who these people were, who was still alive, who we can speak, speak to and try to track them down. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, these people live around the world. So the, just the sheer logistics of trying to do research on this was complicated and requires money. Um, both Russia and I are not affiliated to academic institutions. Uh, we work independently. And so sort of the process of doing this research has been something that's perhaps taken more, not more time than it should, but I think has happened at a pace that has allowed certain things to open up and blossom and uh, allow, you know, we've allowed ourselves to sort of go down certain trails, um, which sometimes are dead ends and other times are Pandora's boxes. And fortunately are mostly Pandora's boxes, which we happily open and get trapped in afterwards. Um, and so kind of one our, as research unfolded very curiously, as research most often does, we started with these interviews around sort of this exhibition nearby in Beirut, Amman, Damascus. Um, and Russia, but my colleague was uh, very lucky to meet this man, Claude Lazare. He's one of the names in that um, acknowledgments page. She met him in 2008 in Mons uh, during an, another exhibition in which she was involved. Um, and we were able to meet with him properly a few years later in 2011 in Paris. Uh, when we went to meet with him, uh, so he's one of the artists from this exhibition. He was acknowledged. We wouldn't have thought that he maybe had some stories to tell us, but it turns out he did. So we went to meet him in his very cute studio in Montmartre. And uh, when he opened the door, he said, I've been waiting for you for 30 years. And I got chills. And he didn't say it dramatically, but we all got, we both got chills. And, um, and in fact, uh, when he had three boxes of material, which, uh, which he had kept from that time, from the time he actually went to Lebanon, he went to Lebanon for the exhibition in 1978. And uh, things, these were objects, these were, you know, papers that his wife, Margot, uh, told him, urged him to keep, uh, which he thought about throwing away, but it was because of his wife that he kept this material. Um, so we have to thank Margot, ultimately, for this project. Um, this was the most valu valuable archive uh, that we have been able to work with so far for this project. So not in Beirut, but rather in Paris. Claude's story elucidated his links to um, an individual named Ezzedine Kalek, who I'll tell you about. So these are just stills from a video, our first interview with him, where he starts showing us images from this exhibition. So you have to realize three years of, you know, some interviews in Beirut, some press clippings. Now we're finally seeing proper images of the exhibition. We're going completely crazy. I mean, where it was completely overwhelming experience. Um, so he has these photographs. Um, which he shares with us, uh, newspaper clippings, everything, you know, most things were in Arabic. He kept them, thanks to Margot. Um, we helped translate them so he understood what, you know, these interviews that were done with him were really about. Um, and so we, you know, in doing this interview with him, um, we understood a whole other story, which really opened up the project for us. Uh, you know, prior to meeting him, we thought, okay, we'll try to figure out why that, you know, how this happened, who some of these artists were, what its impact was in Beirut, what, you know, maybe happened to this museum project. But meeting Claude expanded our project to really try to understand what the practices and relationships were between artists and different um, ideal ideological positions that they had, um, different uh, liberation struggles that meant something to them around which they, their practices were oriented. And so we learned um, that Claude Lazare was very close with this man, 
this man who in many ways is a ghost uh, for us who appears quite often more to Russia. He appears, you know, he appears um, in Russia's life more than mine. Um, but uh, Azadine Kalak is his name. And uh, Azadine Kalak was the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization's representative in Paris in the 1970s. He was there from 1972 until 1978 when he was assassinated. Uh, Kalak and Claude Azar had a very deep friendship around Claude's engagement with the Palestinian cause. And um, in fact, Kalak played an important role in making this exhibition happen in Beirut and enabling a project of this scope um, organized by the PLO by connecting people in Paris and around the world. And so, you know, in trying to understand how an exhibition like this happened, uh, we're curious about how it originated, how it was envisioned to be the beginning of a museum for Palestine, which is what its goal was. And uh, we knew that Mona Saudi, the Jordanian artist who headed the plastic art section in Beirut, uh, played a very, you know, important role. She was actively involved in engaging and motivating people in Beirut and elsewhere. And uh, what we found out through you know, this interview with Claude Azar is that in fact, he and Azadine um, were able to think about this beyond just an exhibition, but to be a museum. And uh, it's because of uh, Claude's relationship and his sort of, uh, his position within the art scene in Paris at that time as part of this um, Salon de la Jeune Peinture, which was a really radical a salon that would take place every year. It became very radical after 1968. Um, he was very connected and he actually had given work to another initiative that was for Chile. It was called the International Resistance Museum for Salvador Allende, which I'll speak a little bit about later. He had donated a work in support of the Chilean people or in support of Salvador Allende. This was post-1973 <coughs> after the coup. And this, uh, a group of these artists, Chilean artists and intellectuals were in Paris. So. Claude, through his uh, connections to these Chilean artists and through these activities in support of Chile, sort of told, as the dean said, why, do, you know, can we can, why don't we do build a museum? This doesn't just have to be an exhibition in Beirut. This could be a museum. We can ask people to actually donate the work, not just exhibit the work for the sake of the exhibition. Um, and uh, as the dean is a very particular person, um, you know, he's a diplomat. He was a representative for the PLO. At that time, what we learned, people like Azadine and a few other representatives like him cared about art, they cared about culture, and they actually saw that the Palestinian struggle and revolution could be won through art and culture. So he often uh, would talk to Claude about the artwork he was making about Palestine. And you know, Claude tells the story of um, a tree that he was painting, and the tree was made of Kalishnikovs. And Azadine, the Palestinian, said, Claude, you know, trees are not made of Kalishnikovs. They're made of bark. They're made of leaves and branches. Palestinians are, n if we are not going to win this war by fighting with guns, we are going to win this war by winning the hearts and minds of people who understand the injustice that's going on. So he had a very particular position and he was not unique. There was a generation of these PLO representatives who, who truly believed um, in a different kind of revolution. And he was very connected to the, the, the workers' unions, to these arts organizations and artist collectives. Um, and this was the case in Paris. This was the case in, uh, in Tokyo, in fact, as well, which I'll, I'll talk about later. So this is like the only official document we have with PLO letterhead talking about how they were going to build this museum. Um, who is going to be involved, the propositions. This, you know, we found it. So everything we have here are actually um, our scans of documents or photographs of documents. <coughs> so I'm just going to show you a few more documents and then sort of take you through the larger story and what sort of unfolded uh, through the exhibition through Past is Quiet. This here is, uh, is the invitation card. It folds in half and you and looking at it, you see how international of an initiative this was, um, the different translations of the exhibition. The artwork is by a, a Moroccan artist named Mohamed Shaba, who just passed away a couple of years ago, who was qu quite engaged with the Palestinian struggle. And these are the two posters for the exhibition. So the one on the right is by Dia al Azawi, an Iraqi artist, um, who actually has a very big retrospective opening this week uh, in Qatar at a museum there. 
uh, which is going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. And on the left is um, a work by, or the poster made by Mohamed Malihi, a Moroccan artist. And what's interesting and kind of what comes up a lot with the project is questioning the documents we have. So we have this catalog which has images of artwork um, and names of artists. One small example, the Russian artists, they probably didn't fit onto the page, but they're actually only listed in the Arabic side of the list of artists. They're not listed on the English side of the catalog. Why? We don't know, but it probably was just a practical issue. Here, the poster was certainly made much closer in time to the opening of the exhibition. So we actually see new artist names that appear on the poster that weren't in the catalog. So to give you a sense of <laughs> kind of the process of this is that you really have to put these pieces together to try to understand, uh, you, you know, to, to understand what just the facts were. And maybe we're not in the end necessarily interested in the facts. Um, maybe that's why we're not drawn to what exact artworks were in the exhibition and trying to track those down. Um, but in fact, the stories that came up around it are perhaps much more interesting. Um, so one of the biggest challenges as we continue to do research, and this research involved um, interviews with people, uh, people who were very generous with us, artists who were involved in the exhibition, other individuals, former gallerists, uh, other people who were somehow affiliated in one way or another to Palestinian solidarity in certain places who knew about the show, uh, was what to do with it. So we had all of this, we had audio interviews, we had video interviews, sometimes just notes if people weren't comfortable with, you know, with us recording them and a lot of scans um, and photographs of documents. So we have very little original material and we weren't trying to collect the objects, the physical material. It was impossible, it was a lot to ask of people and uh, it wasn't necessarily what our, it wasn't interesting to us. We needed the information in these documents. We did not need the objects, objects themselves. And uh, ultimately for us as we proceeded, we weren't really sure you know, the one of the challenges was what to do with this material. How are we going to best tell these stories as we are recording them and collecting them? Uh, neither publishing an article nor a conference paper seemed very uh, sufficient, considering kind of what came out of the research. And we realized quickly that we needed a physical space, perhaps, um, to share these narratives um, and the multiple overlapping and interconnected stories uh, that we are very lucky um, in the end to be able to do that. So, as I mentioned, the exhibition no longer had any documentary traces um, in one place or a repository in an institution. Uh, it's remembered by people, and that was our key for this project. Uh, sometimes it's very much remembered by people and very much not at all remembered by people. And we have to imagine this was, you know, around 40 years ago, one exhibition that someone participated in. Um, sometimes it's a lot to ask for some, you know, what do you remember of this one show you, you know, you gave a work to back in 1978? Many, you know, replied, I don't remember anything about it, actually. Others had stories, like Claude Lazare actually was there for the exhibition. Um, but what's, what's most interesting is actually what comes out of it when they say, I don't remember, and what you show them. You show them, you know, you say, here's an image of the exhibition, do you remember this? Maybe something comes from it. Here's an image of your work from the catalog. Sometimes, again, we may hit more and more dead ends, but almost always we get to a place where we're able to talk about these artist practices beyond kind of the donation of this one work, but rather what collectives they were involved in, what, um, what questions were important to them uh, through their practice, what other uh, sort of uh, political struggles uh, were significant in their practice. And we realized very quickly that for most of these artists, there are many other things that matter to them. Sometimes they maybe gave a work to this Palestinian exhibition, but actually they were very engaged in producing banners and posters for protests about, um, about gentrification in Paris, and they were against the construction of the Pompidou, for example. Um, or that they uh, organized exhibitions with their collective around uh, about the war in Vietnam. So we, you know, we, don't, we don't let these dead ends stop us. We actually allowed ourselves to ask more and more questions, and um, and that usually worked, and that sort of following this, uh, following these, uh, the lead of these individuals ended up leading to what kind of this this project has become. So as I mentioned, that there were not you know these proper, there's no one place uh, or site with this material. Um, 
more than 30 years later and after a civil war, which you know, for many people in Lebanon or everyone in Lebanon was a very difficult time, and after collecting these images and stories, um, we were very lucky in 2013 to be introduced to the director of the MACBA in Barcelona, Bartomeu Marie, and when, um, he invite, when we met with him, he asked us what we were going to do with this research, and we had quite a bit at that time. And he invited us to present the research in an exhibition format at the MACBA. And it was part of the con sort of a context of questions that they were interested in around exhibition history. So that was sort of how we thought about the show then. And this is really how Past is Quiet, how our project as an exhibition came to be. Um, and so, you know, we knew that once we hopefully were to do the show in Makba, that we would be able to continue to tour this exhibition um, to other places. So I'm going to sort of tell you more about the research through the space of the Makba. So this here is something that maybe many of you have seen something like trying to design an exhibition. We had a very, we had a rectangular space, um, a room that was quite large, it's very high ceilings, and the entrance and exit were the same except there was one wall that was curved, which we thought was a curse, but in the end was actually pretty great. It was a fantastic fit to tell the narrative um, of the documents on that wall. And so we had to determine how we were going to tell these stories. We had to come up with some sort of different themes and motifs uh, to be able to do that. And uh, in order to organize the information, the content, and, ha and to figure out a way to inhabit the space. and. At that point, we had dozens and dozens of interviews and many gigabytes of material, <laughs> I would say. Um, like I said, in, in conducting our sort of our detective work, we had been um, chasing clues without necessarily a scheme or an argument that we were trying to find an answer to. Um, and the catalog was functioned like a treasure map for us. And every time we found something or hit a dead end, we went back to the pages of the catalog. So the catalog was very central to us, and we ended up kind of <coughs> making that very present in the exhibition. Um, at the same time, a lot of our findings were coincidences, completely unexpected surprises. Uh, and we wanted to sort of bring that also to the exhibition itself, to acknowledge our process of research within the exhibition. So there was a lot of haphazardness that we had to make sense of and try to give to the audience. So this is, um, so we, we started doing that. So we kind of organized the exhibition. This is, we worked with graphic designers in Beirut to sort of think about it and figure out how to make this, uh, transform this into something that would make sense to people. And ultimately what we were working with were stories. Um, sometimes the document told a story, sometimes these interviews told stories. These were our sort of tests. And this was sort of a practice that we, we did quite often, was we would take tracing paper and write out certain names, certain names, certain exhibitions, certain collectives or moments, um, and, try, and try to link them. This is really what we did you know, every, every so often. We would come back, add new names in, because what we were ultimately trying to do with uh, this research was try to understand the network of people who were involved in it. Um, try to understand how these artists from Japan came to know about this exhibition in Beirut. Why did they give work? Who told them about it? Um, and what unfolded was a really beautiful cartography of artists, of gallerists, um, and other in intellectuals around the world. And sometimes they were official, um, official uh, individuals like these representatives in Paris and in Tokyo who represented the Palestinian people. Sometimes they were gallerists who you know, were friends with an artist. Um, unfortunately, today I don't have time to go into all of them because um, it would take four hours at minimum. Um, but so what we, uh, what, what we were able to do is, at least within the exhibition here, is um, organize uh, on one side. So when you walk into the exhibition space, one wall, and I will show you the wall here. On the right-hand side, you sort of see that curved wall. Uh, what we did was decided that this would be the most effective way um, to start telling the exhibition story of 1978 was to tell it chronologically. So the really the only space that is in any f form of chronology is this wall. So we start with sort of these documents, the invitation for the exhibition, um, the poster, different uh, newspaper articles, which you can see. So these are all just vinyl reproductions on the wall. And there were wall texts. 
what's difficult, and it looks like there's a lot of text, is that this exhibition was in Catalan, Spanish, and English. Yeah, so you had a lot more text on the wall than you necessarily uh, wanted, um, but that was what we had to do, and we were, you know, we had to find uh, graphic, you know, solutions to it. Um, but what you see here is a video. So while the documents, there, you know, we had to edit down from hundreds and hundreds of documents, we showed some, you know, important ones to illustrate points that um, needed to be made, and people could spend time reading some of those documents or looking at the images. We also edited videos, so there are actually 18 videos within Past Is Quiet, which we, um, Russia and myself, edited with an editor to be able to tell these stories. So, what we found was most effective to share this research and material was through time-based video. Um, we wouldn't call they're not they're not artworks, um, but they're video documents. Um, and so this video here, uh, which at the end I have the videos and I'm happy to share as much time as we have. I can share these videos with you. But every video is quite different. Some were videos that tell the you know explain the context of what was happening in Lebanon at that time. So it was more of a slideshow um, telling the story of the Israeli sort of invasion of southern Lebanon, uh, what that looked like, just so people understand the context and of, of the moment of when this exhibition took place. Uh, this video here uh, is of different people remembering the exhibition. So th this is the first time we interviewed Claude Lazare. Um, he tells us sort of his memory of, of the exhibition and his visit to Beirut and, uh, and some really f spectacular stories. Um, one of which was, you know, he landed in Beirut, the Israeli, um, the Israeli army was in southern Lebanon and there was a meeting. They decided, they said, we need to talk about if we can actually do this exhibition. The Israelis are in southern Lebanon. Maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe this is the wrong time to do this. Mind you, this is an exhibition of probably over 200 artworks in a very big hall. And they decided and they said, no, this is what exactly what we need to do. This is exactly the time that we have to do this show. If we don't do the show, then they've won. If we do the show, then we're continuing to live our lives and show the strength of you know, support for the Palestinian cause. Um, we also, within sort of this story, was in an interview with um, one of the PLO officials uh, remembering what happened to the bombing of the office that he was sort of responsible for. Um, and also a Palestinian writer who was living in Beirut at that time who tells the story of remembering just, you know, she lived not too far from the exhibition um, where it was happening, and she remembered every day sort of just walking in and going to see her favorite pieces, and it, it seemed like it functioned like a museum in a way because it was up for quite a while, especially at that time, it was a, a long amount of time to have a show. And, uh, and, and for her, she, you know, in this video was able to sort of convey how important it was to see how these many artists and these artists who gave artwork in support of the Palestinian cause, that this is the first time that they could really understand that people supported them. Um, there's even, an, we sort of translate an excerpt from it, but there's an, a, a round table with some of these artists that visited. So there were two Italian artists, uh, Claude Azar, who's a French artist, and uh, Neto, who is a Brazilian artist, came from abroad. They were invited for the exhibition opening. So there was a round table discussion with a journalist about kind of their experience in Beirut, what they thought about Palestinian art, what they thought about what was happening in Lebanon. Um, and at one point there was a fighter who was in, you know, in his gear, um, walking through the exhibition and the journalist sort of calls him over and asks, you know, what are you doing here? What do you think about this exhibition? <coughs> and he said, well, I'm fighting in the South and today's my day off. And so I heard that these international artists came here and gave their work in support of the Palestinian cause and I want to see it. And to see it means so much to me to understand that people outside of southern Lebanon believe in us and support us. So you you know, so there are these these small moments um, with sort of what some of the press or even through the survey, there was actually a survey that happened of this exhibition. It was pretty remarkable. Um, to see how what this meant for people who were there living in Beirut at that time. And so sort of this wall really sort of tells that story of this exhibition opening um, of the artists who are there. There's images, sorry, they're very small, but images of artists hanging out with local artists, Lebanese and other Arab artists who are there, um, hanging out, having drinks, going to dinner, the things that normal people do when they visit. And, um, 
And, and then actually, because some of these artists stayed for a while, they started their own atelier. There was a workshop. So there are local artists working with foreign artists to produce new work, and they did another exhibition. So even more, more than just one exhibition really came out of, out of the show, which is quite special. And here's sort of the, the end of the story in a way. So there were a couple of videos on this wall, and that's a speaker. So um, what's, what we wanted to make clear during this exhibition is we didn't want to hide all the cords for the videos, for the screens, for the, for the speakers, but we wanted our process, or we wanted kind of even just this technical, the technical elements to be very visible to the public. We didn't want it, not that it wasn't sparkly and clean, but we wanted to be, you know, we wanted to expose these, these elements. So uh, this speaker is actually my voice telling the story um, as it was recounted to me by different individuals as to what happened to the objects, what happened to the artwork. So even within the videos, um, which sometimes are silent, sometimes are you know combinations of archival footage, of interviews we've done, uh, and our own voices, we are, we are present within this exhibition, which was really important to us um, to acknowledge our own role within this, not to take credit, but to take responsibility um, in what we are trying to, what what we heard from people, um, and what we want to sort of bring forward to the public. So this here is a projection of part of that video, or it's this is the projection of the video that you saw, just a part of, of hands turning the page of the exhibition catalog. So it was really important to us to make this catalog very present within the show. This is the only place that you'll actually see very easily all the artworks from the exhibition. So the exhibition has no original artwork. Uh, sorry, past is quiet. Our exhibition has no original artwork. This is really, this video is the only place that you really see the objects. Um, some people were not happy with that. Others, you know, but we sort of, there's a reason in which we do that. Um, there's no, there is some artwork now, but it's very complicated. <laughs> this sort of section here, um, to some may have seemed uh, like a memorial, but it was quite important to us to recognize the work of Azadine Kalak, this PLO representative that we acknowledge. So Claude and even a few other people that we met with um, when we went to interview them about this exhibition and what they remembered, several of them said, I will talk to you as long as you bring back Azadine's name. So he was kind of this person who kept coming back um, as a ghost in many ways, as a ghost to Russia has come as a ghost to other writers, in fact, and we sort of cite, cite a text um, by Mahmoud Darwish, a Palestinian writer of Azadine Kala coming to him in a dream. Um, and, uh, and this actually, this, this print on the wall is a, it's a, it's a little scary, but it's foreshadowing of Azadine's assassination. So these PLO representatives who lived in different places were the target not only by the Israeli Mossad, but also by another faction, Abu Nidal, a Palestinian faction, working with certain Iraqis um, to sort of take power. So many PLO representatives in the 1970s were assassinated, and Azadine was one of them. And he knew that he was under threat. It was not a surprise to him. Every, pal every representative knew this was a possibility. Claude actually, in fact, um, tells us the story of Azadine kind of moving house to house during his last year in Paris, that he, he couldn't be in one place because they would know where he is. And, um, and this image here is actually, so it's hard to see, but it's a photograph that Claude took at the opening in the exhibition in Beirut. And the artwork, the right side is a mirror, and Azadine's face, or his, you know, his, his profile is reflected in it. And on the left side is a painting of a gun. So you know, Claude sort of knew this and took this image, but it, in, it really does foreshadow his, his assassination, which happened just a few days after his return to Paris in, um, on August 3rd. So, you know, I w in the first version of, our, of this exhibition at the MACBA, um, Azadine Kalik played this important role because it was, he was so central for us and for this project. In the second iteration, which I'll show you some images of, he wasn't there as much. We sort of, we talk more about all the, several of the PLO representatives and the work that they were doing. So as we sort of travel the exhibition, it transforms quite a bit. So sort of taking you through the exhibition, the right-hand side is the narrative of the exhibition in Beirut in 78, and this back area talks about people. So it talks about, you know, we, we talk about as a dean, we have different, a video on the left-hand side of several artists and filmmakers remembering their relationship to Azadine uh, and what his role was within their practice. 
and also um, a couple of other videos looking at these these individuals from the acknowledgments page, those who were, you know, gallerists in Paris whose archives don't exist, for example, um, who are very hard to find information about, um, or you know, artists or other individuals who are involved. And then this area here. Let's see. So this is kind of the madness of of kind of what what really is. Um, what the basis of, of past disquiet is, is trying to unearth these networks of artists that were involved. So in, in looking, just starting with the names of, of the artists uh, who participated in the exhibition in 78, here we sort of organized, let's see if we can find here a better way. We sort of took one whole wall um, to tell the story of different countries and different practices. So here, you know, you'll see sort of this disbursement of wall texts and videos and, um, and vinyls. And actually, um, we start all the way on sort of the left side with Japan. So we kind of went country or region by region. It was kind of the way that made the most sense to organize how we want to tell the story because there's, there's a lot to tell. Um, it was subtle. We didn't put huge country names above every section. and. The way that we designed this exhibition, because it was this open space, we hoped people would go left to right and right to left and cross, cross, you know, through the space. Um, there wasn't one way to see the exhibition, and um, and so this area here really tried to, tries to unearth these artist networks. So this area here, sort of dedicated Japan, to Japan, has some material related to, you know, this here is a poster of um, Masawa Dachi and Koji Wamasutu's film PFLP Red Army. Um, which we talk about kind of their practices and um, a film that they had made in 1970 about pal the Palestinian struggle and the Palestinian revolution. And, um, and there's actually some images here which I'll show uh, telling the story of JALA, the Japan Afro-Asian Latin American Artists Association, my favorite of all of the artist collectives. So this organization was established um, in 1977, and it was headed by Ichiro Haryu, who is a radical Japanese art critic and curator. And he was uh, also the head of the Afro, the Japan sort of section of the Afro-Asian Writers Union. This page here is from a book that's about the history of JALA um, from 1977 to 1993. If anyone has written about them, please tell me, because right now I don't know of anyone who's written in Japanese or in English about this association, which still exists today. Um, so here you have um, Fatih Abdul Hamid in the middle with a fantastic mustache. He was the PLO representative at that time. And on the right is Ichiro Haryu opening this exhibition in 1978. And, and what's interesting is that this was not just a one-off support for the Palestinian cause. After that, the Union of Palestinian Artists um, collaborated with JALA, this organization, to, to they decided to do an exchange every year. So in 1979, um, 11 Japanese artists actually went to Beirut and uh, to Syria and to Jordan. And, uh, and they spent time in the camps. They met with artists. Uh, they were there to witness the struggle. This was something that was not uncommon at that time, but this happened with artists. So this happened with the German Democratic Republic's Artist Union. This happened with the Japanese. Um, here, these are just images from, from the exhibition itself. Uh, but what we learned very quickly in trying to, um, we were very lucky to be able to go to Japan and to do research and interview some people. We were only able to interview one of the artists. What we learned is that the PLO's office in Tokyo was very connected to JALA, to this organization. Um, the office at that time, uh, the PLO office, thanks to Fatih Abdel Hamid, uh, produced this really fantastic magazine called Philistine Biladi, which means Palestine, my homeland. It was a subscription magazine. It was um, bi-monthly. And for almost six years or so, they produced this magazine, which really dealt with third world struggles, with the Palestinian cause. There were reports from Lebanon from Palestine from the front. There were, you know, articles written by Koji Wamasutu and Masao Adachi. Um, so they dealt with art and culture, not only kind of militant struggles. And uh, and there is actually what's interesting is there's one individual, Vladimir Tamari. He was a Palestinian artist who's lived in Japan for many years, and he in, was 
and still is the link for many of these individuals in Japan. So he was active as a graphic designer. He, pr he designed sort of this up here, but uh, he worked very closely with another individual named Toshio Sato. Toshio Sato was a graphic designer, not only for JALA, the arts organization, but also for the PLO office. So you see how sometimes just these, these individuals who happen to be involved in two organizations end up bringing people together. Um, even a few years later, the PLO representative who, you know, who is said to be not as fantastic as Fatih Abdel Hamid did still support culture and, and brought this sort of poster collection uh, or exhibited a poster collection um, in 1984 uh, to in, in Tokyo. So within the exhibition, it's hard. There, you know, these are just a couple of the stories. Um, that we you know, try to tell through some of these documents, through the wall text, and, and through video. So um, as we continue, we sort of tell stories around um, the Arab biennials. Um, there was a biennial in Baghdad in 1974 and one in Rabat in Morocco in 1976. And it was called, uh, there was, it was the first and the second Arab biennial. This is organized by the Union of Arab Artists. And this was the union, sort of the, the connection of different unions from countries in the Arab world where artists decided that they should come together and figure out a way to show and exhibit together. So the 1970s and late 60s was really a moment when Arab artists, say Moroccan artists, started showing in, in Baghdad and Iraqi artists showed, started showing in Lebanon and Beirut. So this is when artists kind of took, it, took this into their own hands um, and started, kind of built this union together and the biennial was sort of their hallmark project. Eventually, sort of the governments took over and it fell apart. So um, it was a very quick, <laughs> I would say, like a seven year long project, um, which was quite ambitious. Um, and so here we have, you know, some covers, some posters from some of the biennials. We also sort of explored different practices of the participating artists from the Beirut exhibition. So in Morocco, what we actually see is that there is a, a, a radical cultural review called Souffle which uh, many of the artists participated in. They were, uh, they were, there was, this magazine had poetry. Um, it also had artwork produced by these artists. Um, and they had an issue even dedicated to Palestine. There were different sort of exhibitions and festivals where these artists decided to sort of uh, bring their work, which the government deemed was not true Moroccan art. The government really liked naive artwork. Um, they even did an exhibition in the late 60s at Club Med in Marrakesh showing Moroccan art. And it was all very you know, figurative and naive work, right? Um, these artists who were practicing, who were, you know, produce abstract work and were teaching in Casablanca decided to stage their own counter exhibition. They did it in public space. You know, the Club Med was obviously a private club. Um, they did it in Jemal Fna, which is sort of the main square in Marrakesh, and, uh, and brought their paintings to public space where people could, you know, the citizens could actually see it. Um, even one of these artists in 1978, Mohamed Malihi, who I mentioned in a poster, uh, ran for mayor in his town, in Asila, um, to try to bring artists to produce work there. So they actually started a festival and they produced these really fantastic murals. They invited artists from all over the world to be a part of it. Um, eventually, in the late 80s, Bahrain sort of co-opted it, but it still happens. Um, but it came from a, you know, a very different place where artists were trying to bring their work, which they believed was true Moroccan art, to the street in a different way. So the reason I mentioned these different kind of exhibitions or moments is because these are the practices and these were the artists who are part of this exhibition in Beirut. And when we try to unpack what they were doing, we see that um, them donating to an exhibition in support of the Palestinian cause was just one of the things that represented their practice. And their practices were engaged, asked questions around, um, around other sort of uh, political causes or injustices or dealt with sort of local issues. Uh, in Italy and France, you see similar things. You see these really fantastic collectives that come up. Many of these collectives are not written about in sort of traditional art history. So, so far I've not found much written about Jala, right, in Japan. Um, in Italy, the artists, almost all of the artists who showed were part of two collectives. Uh, one was called Archicoda, based in Tuscany, and one was called Alzaia in Rome. When we went and met with a very prominent Italian art historian and showed him the list of the Italian artists, we said, what do, you, what do you think about these artists? He said, these are rubbish. Why are you talking to me about these artists? So what we, what we noticed very quickly is that many of the artists who are in the show are outside of the market. They're outside of written into tra sort of traditional art history. 
for many reasons. Their practices, you know, were not of interest to maybe some art historians, to some curators. Um, but then in other ways, we do see that they were present in biennials. Um, they did their own interventions in the Venice Biennial, for example. Um, and the sort of left side here, we sort of delve into France and the Salon de la Jeune Peinture, which is this really unbelievable salon which took place every year in Paris. Um, after 1968, it became very politicized and radical and individual artists couldn't show. So it was only collectives of artists around specific causes that showed within the salon. So um, what we notice is in one of these images here, there was a group of artists, including Claude Lazar, who started the Collectif Palestine, artists who were concerned with Palestine and the Palestinian cause. Um, they ended up collaborating with these Italian artists in Venice, um, actually during the 1976 biennial, to do an intervention in a public space about the massacre of a Palestinian camp that happened Talazata in 1976. So you then see sort of these, these relationships that appear through an intervention. You see how certain artists in one collective in France work with an Italian collective to produce um, something that's very much not written into the art history, like the history of the Venice Biennial, for example. Um, and I will try to end quickly with sort of the last stories. Well, this is just one image. Um, this is the uh, this sort of intervention that happened in, in Mestre uh, in Venice in 1976 by the Salon, uh, sorry, by the Collectif Palestine and Archie Coda. And sort of the last uh, part of this exhibition is really looking at these different museums in exile. So I mentioned early on that this initiative to actually have a build a collection for Palestine as opposed to just an exhibition in support of Palestine was um, one of the geneses that we realized was this International Resistance Museum for Salvador Allende. So this is a, an initiative that was, here are some posters, um, in 1972, there was a, a, a proper museum that opened in Chile in support of Allende. So a collection was built in support of Allende's sort of socialist democratic ideology. After the coup in 1973, artists were dispersed and were exiled. And then these artists and writers and curators decided to start the collection up again wherever they were. So in France, in Mexico City, in Helsinki, in Stockholm, they asked artists to donate again, or different artists to donate artwork in support of Allende. So they toured this, these exhibitions uh, within certain countries, um, and this was called the International Resistance Museum for Salvador Allende. In 1990, these works were repatriated to Chile, and today there exists the Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende. So there's actually this collection in a proper museum that houses sort of all of these gestures of solidarity of international support from that period. What's interesting in terms of trying to put this Palestinian initiative into a larger mu museological history from that time is not only do you have this Chilean model that inspired the Palestinians, but it also inspired uh, another initiative, two other initiatives, one for South Africa, um, an anti-apartheid collection. It was called the, there was a committee formed. Again, when, when I talk about these different museums, it's because the same artists were actually involved in all of these projects. So. There was the Art Against Apartheid, or Committee of Artists Against Apartheid that organized an exhibition, organized the donation of artwork by artists um, toward this collection. And it was first shown in New York in the early 80s. And eventually this collection was returned to South Africa. Curiously, it doesn't have an, its own museum. It doesn't live in a museum today. So the first time, the, f the place that it was exhibited um, first when it returned to South Africa was the parliament. So there are some great images which I can show you later of uh, the sort of apartheid leaders uh, of the paintings of these white men and women being pulled down and then the artwork, you know, Rauschenberg's artwork, kind of all these unbelievable artist work going up into the parliament, um, sort of showing this regime change in a way. And, uh, and today this collection lives at the Western Cape University at the Maibui Center, which is a really interesting um, university, but they still have yet to find a proper home to exhibit it. But at that time, they didn't transfer it to a museum because nothing was properly desegregated. So they didn't trust anyone with this very, very valuable collection. At the same time, there was another initiative in the early 80s to build a collection for Nicaraguan, for the Nicaraguan people. So again, similar artists. This time it was Latin American artists 
showed, exhibited work in Paris at the Palais de Tokyo under sort of the direction of Jacques Long and also in Spain. And these works then were shipped to Nicaragua and a museum was eventually established, um, which was called at one point the Museo Julio Cortazar. Today, its sort of situation is a bit um, complicated, um, but they're trying to rebuild the museum. <laughs> and um, so really with our exhibition, we're, we started with certain questions and we end up with many more. Um, we have some answers to those questions. There still are, um, there are many questions that have gone unanswered and as we continue to sort of travel the show, we're able to continue to do research, um, find answers to questions. For example, um, in Nicaragua now, we may have finally um, found people who are willing to answer <laughs> our questions about what's happened to the exhibition. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of quick images from Berlin. The second, second iteration of the show is in Berlin uh, at the House of World Cultures. And here we were able to, you know, it was done in sort of the, the context of, a, of their new program called Kanonfragen, which is looking at the history, sort of the art historical canon. So here we were able to ask, not only do research about German artists, and actually there were only three West German artists, there are no um, German Democratic Republic artists in the exhibition, but we realized quickly that the protocol was signed just after this exhibition. So we were able to eventually meet with artists who participated um, in other exchanges between sort of the Palestinian Artists Union and the GDR Artists Union. And so we were able to sort of add kind of new information and new research. Again, sort of here we're able to inhabit the center of the space a bit more, um, still consists of the same materials, videos, um, vinyls, sort of these documents, which we call hanging documents, which are more complete kind of versions of um, some of the material. And I'll just quickly get to the two sort of new additions. Sorry, I'm rushing through, I'm super over time. So here this sort of wall, which you see the corner of, which maybe you'll see all of it very soon, sorry. Well, I'll speak here. So here we actually tried to map out, do an alternative map of exhibitions. So every exhibition that we had referenced within a video, within a document, within our show, Past is Quiet, we mapped it out chronologically and then over space, geographically. So what we see through our version of the questions that we have been interested in you know, asking questions about is that quickly New York is no longer the center for us, for the questions we're interested in. In fact, you know, certain parts of Europe, um, South America, the Arab world end up being more interesting and those end up being the centers of art for what, for the questions we are asking. So this was sort of an exercise which maybe is a bit messy, but when you see it in real life, it's easier to understand. Um, but this is precisely kind of one of, the, one of these practices of trying to map out a version of different versions of art history which um, which are not necessarily written into into <coughs> the canon. Um, in addition, we another exercise we had was we basically took all of the names of the artists who participated in the exhibition in Beirut and ran them through kind of the Oxford Art Online databases, these like official artist databases, um, to see who comes up and who doesn't come up. Uh, most people do not come up. Most people were not in there. Uh, and so we left them blank. These were sort of like card catalog, basic information. It was, you know, they want to charge us a lot of money to reproduce the information. So we actually didn't reproduce the information. So this comes into, you know, asking the question about what, what sort of history is available to a general public versus, you know, scholars, for example. So, um, so we found some errors. We found, um, you know, many people had the urge to like fill in information. They're like, but we know about this person. Why don't you write something? So, um, I think one of the artists actually, because it said he was French, he, it said he was Egyptian because he was born in Egypt. He's actually French, Claude. He wanted to go up and I think he like scratched it out and wrote French, not Egyptian. So again, this is sort of just um, a manifestation of, of these exercises of these, you know, drawing and mapping. Um, but this, you know, addresses this question of, of the art historical canon, what's available, um, even just information-wise to the public, who's written in and who's written out. And I think our hope is that slowly more and more of these people will be written in. I'm gonna stop there, because I've gone well over and we'll be happy to take questions and show you more material. Thank you, Christine. It's 
unbelievable almost that it all started with one catalog and <laughs> kind of one artist list. Um, I'm actually just going to go right into question and answers because I'm sure everyone has a lot and you know if uh, if there's kind of time and space I'll fill that in so if anyone wants to ask Christine questions thank you yes. uh, thank you very much for being here tonight and for uh, introducing us to the this amazing research you uh, you've been doing I'm really really impressed uh, I'm also very impressed because I think I slightly realized the huge amount of work you that was uh, necessary to really may i say start from scratch yes. um, as a matter of fact actually uh, my name is philip charms i come from france and i live in hong kong for 12 years and more than 15 years ago i've been involved into organizing an exhibition with international artists who are mostly french uh, that, and this is why I want to talk to you, uh, as I see in one of the first slides, uh, this exhibition where was described as uh, itinerant exhibition, and that was exactly our project back mm. then when I was an art student. I studied in the French uh, National Art Decorative School in Strasbourg in the borderline with Germany, and back then when I was an art student, I met um, a student, student from Palestine, from Gaza, who was actually a refugee mm -hmm. and who would become a, a close friend of mine and who once told me uh, when he was still talk speaking English and I was one of the only fluent students uh, in English so I can communicate with him, he asked me that he wanted to do something for his country. Mm -hmm. So we start the whole project with other students okay. to create um, an exhibition about Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main concept was we started as, as students and we invited, we let uh, foreign people, I would say, join the exhibition. And the idea, it was also itinerant. So we exhibited a few times in, uh, in France, obviously. It went to Geneva, Switzerland, Belgium, and Italy, etc., etc. And every time the idea was uh, we were into this idea of creative common thing, like mm -hmm. modify the exhibition if you want. Here are basically, here are the keys. And back then, consider that that was not that much internet, and I was a complete beginner with computers, so I was, in I was the curator, technically. One of the artists, also the curator. So I had to deal with building in PowerPoint that could not be sent through emails, because back then, uh, you can send like more than one megabyte for a touch file, etc., etc., etc. But my point is, technically back then, there was internet. Mm -hmm. So even though this exhibition has been made 15 years ago, and uh, some of the artists made it out, uh, I can pass you the contacts later That's if nice. you like, but we still have trace, and I know that this original PowerPoint is on internet today, so oh, technically, fantastic. I can show to you mm -hmm. and I really understand that for you there was no internet nothing and because of uh, this bombing thing everything has been vanished and it's because I believe people like you who almost dedicate a huge part of your life mm -hmm. that we can still see it today and um, what was it Klaus Lazar who opened the door once and said I've been waiting for you yeah. 30 years? Yes. Okay, for me it's like 15 years ago, but we'll I'm so happy to meet you tonight. <laughs> Fantastic. That's amazing. Thank you. I mean, I think this is, it's, it's not really about people like myself or Russia. It's really these people that we've interviewed, like Claude Lazar or someone like yourself, who are willing to give time and share information and material. And I think maybe many of us in the room are those people who have given that time or are on the side of us asking asking a lot of a lot of people and to talk about people's past is emotional it's difficult so um, so I have to thank you because I think it's you know the fact that you maybe still have something and you're willing to share I think is is what allows this history to be able to continue to be you know to be public or to be made a part of history in a different way so thank you I'd abs I will get your information it would be fantastic to hear more about it thank you So uh, I wanted to ask about what your overall sort of feeling was about the actual effectivity of the exhibition for its original audience in, mm. in Beirut. And, you know, because the whole um, 
issue of how you use a contemporary style, a modern style of art uh, for some political purpose is a very, it's a very difficult question. Lots of approaches have been tried and uh, a lot have not been that effective actually, you know, uh, and or sometimes the effectivity is not as art, it's as some, as a sort of token, you know, mm -hmm. an example to me would be Picasso's Guernica. I don't find it a very effective piece of political art, but it became a kind of token for the the Spanish struggle against fascism mm -hmm. as a as a thing in itself, you know. Right. Um, so when the the fighter came into the exhibition and he felt a sense of solidarity, was that just the sort of uh, you know, it's the thought that counts, people are thinking about us, or is there something in the art itself that is, you know, really, uh, you know, s saying something? Because right. I, I feel at the end of the day, it does come back to the art itself. Mm -hmm. Is the art, does the Same art something. work? Does sure. it do a job? Does it, does it just speak to the converted and tell them what they know already? Or is, right. it, is it actually going to change hearts and minds in right. some way? Right. Um, and when it comes down to talking about trying to change the art historical canon and whether some of these artists should be in that that story instead of some of the ones that are already in there then it surely has to come down to these questions of a quality understood not in a <coughs> a narrow aesthetic sense but in terms of effectivity of what it's trying to do mm. well i mean i think thank you for your questions i think they're a few different points to make in response to that. So I think that there's a spectrum of solidarity. Not every single artist who gave an artwork was a gung-ho uh, Palestinian supporter who was there at every protest, wherever they lived, and was making artwork about that subject. Sometimes you had those people. On the other hand, you know, one artist we met with when we asked why he gave a work, he said, I'm an artist, I don't have money to give, but I have an artwork to give in support of the cause. So this is, so there's that end of, um, that's, their, that's their currency, and by them giving an artwork, they're showing their gesture of support. Sometimes that work may be about Chile or South Africa or Palestine, or maybe it's just the work that they produce. So. What's interesting is this collection wasn't really curated, right? It was up to the artist to give the work that they wanted to give. Um, Roberto Mata, who was engaged, he actually produced a triptych for for this purpose about Palestine. Um, you have a huge range of of subjects of artwork. I mean, even if you want to analyze by you know, and this is inappropriate to do, but if you want to see how many abstract works or how many figurative works. It's not even the most interesting question to ask because sometimes an abstract work in Morocco meant the same thing as a figurative work in France because they were both doing the same thing, right? So, um, so I think it does, yes, it does come down to the original artworks um, f in many ways, but I think also for us, the, this was meant to be a collection for Palestine. So kind of maybe what's for us more important is the fact that this is a collection of artwork not to say the objects are unimportant. Um, having important names uh, or also names that are unfamiliar are, I think, equally as important because it shows that there are artists who care about something who are, you know, are not Miro. Miro gave a work. Maybe he actually didn't give the work. It's actually his gallerist who gave a work on behalf of him. So when you say Mi there's a Miro in the collection, what does that actually mean? You have to really analyze. And we don't have answers for every single artist, right? Most of them have passed, or many of them have passed away. Many of them don't remember. But we know that Miro and Tapies, that actually um, Jacques Dupin, who is the head of Max Gallery, gave them, we were told, gave them on behalf of them, right? What, whether he spoke to them or not, we are not sure. So, um, so it's also hard to show, to sort of really understand what the level of um, who cared the most or what, you know, this level of solidarity. Um, some works, you know, if you, if you actually want to look at some works, indeed, like, Mata, he produced this triptych for, for the purpose of this exhibition. Um, so I don't know if I, so I mean, I think also in terms of writing into art history, it's not just about the object, it's about the practices. So these collectives that existed in, in Italy or in France that did interventions and organized their own exhibitions around Chile or around Vietnam or Haiti, um, these are important. And I think this is where exhibition histories or histories not just about specific artists, but rather their larger practices and what they were involved in is really important. That's maybe what we're drawn to and 
maybe it's a, it allows to tell a larger story than just the practice of one particular artist. And that is something we do in the exhibition. We did, um, we have, you know, there's one of the videos which is, you know, an edited uh, seven or eight artists talking to us about their practices, um, about posters they made around particular causes or around um, the questions that concern them at that time, whether they're Palestine or something else. So. I actually then want to follow up with perhaps one of one, one last question is um, as your exhibition traveled it's almost seeing that you whether it's through the space or it's through exhibition display strategies that you are pushed to represent the stories that you wanted to tell I wonder how do you negotiate that and apart from that what what are the afterlives of these materials that you're imagining yeah I mean there's so there are hundreds and hundreds of stories so it's really hard to edit down to tell the stories that um, that we think are important or what we think an audience would be interested in. But in the end, I think it's really grounded. Um, what we present is grounded in maybe sometimes stories that really stick to us or certain themes that come up. So these museums in exile and trying to think about what it means to build a collection, um, what it meant to build a collection in, say, the 1970s and 80s around political causes, around um, certain you know questions of injustice that is a very interesting question to ask today so this is something that for example um we could start only with that you know you can walk into the exhibition and start with these questions of how to build how museums were built or how some museums or collections were built at that time um the story of the 78 exhibition um that wall is probably I mean, it's they're all it's pretty crazy. There's a lot of material in there. Um, it's it is very hard to edit down. But I think within the videos um, at the MacBa, for example, when you walk into the room, you would hear voices. So there were no headphones in the exhibition in MacBa. So um, our process and our methodology um, and our presence, our voices, are heard when you walk into the exhibition, at least in the MacBa version. It was a little overwhelming. I I was I was standing and I was watching people come in. Some people would walk in and hear all these voices and be very overwhelmed and walk out. That's how we felt. We were, you know, it is an overwhelming experience in the way that we did not want, there is not one narrative, there are many voices um, and we want to offer those voices and the different narratives. Um, some people walk in and are drawn towards one thing or are drawn towards one image. And I think with the show, we're really trying to create a world or recreate a world. We don't expect people to read and watch everything. It would take quite a while to do. Um, but we hope that if people walk away um, with some bits of information or start asking some questions about their life today, that's really what we want to get out of it. Um, so it's, it's hard to do that edit, and it's um, something we fight about quite a bit in terms of like what we should put in and what we need to pull out. Um, but in terms of the afterlife, so this is, you know, like this hard drive has it all, right? You can like, <laughs> but this hard drive doesn't mean anything to someone. You just, you know, give it to them. You know, if you can't like, s you know, to set, you know, to send <coughs> objects and have someone, you know, recurate an exhibition based off the same works. There's a lot of stuff in here, so there is a hierarchy in terms of graphic design and what we want people to see and read and what we're less interested in them seeing and really understanding, but understanding the aesthetic of. Um, and so we, you know, this is some. So we're currently touring the exhibition still. It's had two lives so far, and it changes every time. And hopefully, you know, we're lucky. It gets to hopefully get better every time. And the exhibition will come to Beirut, which will probably be the hardest exhibition next year um, because it is the place with all of the emotions and trauma. So we're getting ready for that. Um, but, you know, even there, we're trying to figure out how to make a space perhaps where, you know, people can record their own memories of the exhibition or record their own stories from that period. P you know, we can imagine a Q&A session in Beirut as like, but I remember this and I, you know, and we, while we are happy to encourage that, it will never end. So we want to create a space where people feel that they can contribute. Um, <coughs> we're working on a publication. We finally have nearly gotten all of the funding for it. And this publication is not a catalog for the exhibition, but rather is um, it accompanies the project as a whole. So we're asking different scholars to write about specific um, moments, places, collectives, exhibitions. Um, and it's not a book of documents because, again, a book of, of these images of these documents will still not make much sense. The sort of what we needed is the space to tell these stories. Um, but ultimately, is a website. That's you know what we're trying to build is um, something that probably the Asia Art Archive is very good at doing um, is build a website where we can share this material online. 
um, these documents, but in a way that's interactive. It's not just a library of material, but rather is somehow a transformation of the exhibition to a, an online space where uh, people can read through these documents, um, to watch the videos from the exhibition, to read, see material that we haven't been able to put in this, um, in you know, in the exhibition proper. Um, but there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of work that's going to go into fundraising for that, and also figuring out copyright, and figuring out kind of where we stand with copyright and what we can put online and what we can. And I think m a lot of it we can. I think it will not be as bi a big of a problem as we're imagining. But we're hoping that that we're hoping that that's sort of the closing of our project after it tours, um, and that then people from there can kind of take this material and do what they want with it. Then maybe someone will then be inspired to look into you know, Jala, and they have some material to work with to start asking questions about it, for example. Um, so while it's a closing, hopefully it's an opening um, to kind of share the material that has been shared with us, um, which is, is quite important. Um, please join me in thanking Christine Curry for sharing all of this information and hyper with us. And thank you very much for being part of the evening as well. <laughs>